Amen. Part three of this uh, controversial series, Truth Over Trend. Who thought of doing this during a presidential election race? Whose idea during the tension? It was mine, by the way. And just let's go. <laughs> Let's go. So we're in the third installment. Uh, we began talking about, kicked it off. Part one was about transgenderism and homosexuality. And what we're doing is looking at what the culture calls right or is trending and examining it in the light of the truth of God's word, like removing kind of ideas and opinions out of the equation and just letting God's word speak for itself. And then last week we talked about just this sex-infused, crazed culture, man. We talked about the sex lies and culture culture ties last week, and those were very intentional. I, I, we've set this series up to kind of lead into one another uh, the topic we're even discussing today. Those are important foundations to kind of have the right conversation about the truth over trend topic today. But let me ask you a question as we begin this important conversation before I tell you what it is. What is shaping your beliefs today? I think it's an important question for us to analyze and reflect. Why, what do I believe and what's actually shaping those beliefs? Is it really the shifting trends of this world? Is it influenced by media or personalities or tradition or families? Or is it the unchanging truths of God's word? We live in a culture that is changing constantly, but the crucial truth is this, God's standards do not change when society does. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, are you ready for the word today? I need you all to be get ready for the word today. It's going to be a tough one, and I need some feedback and amens and hallelujahs up in here, okay? When, when culture says live your truth, Jesus tells us to live by his truth. So today, I do want to challenge you, man. I want to, you again to set aside your ideas, your opinions, your, 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 your thoughts, or anyone else's, to be honest, and lean into God's word. And as followers of Jesus, for those of you that do identify as followers of Jesus today, we're called not to mold God's word to fit into culture, but allow God's word to transform us in the midst of culture. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says it like this. See to it. Like, hey, make sure this don't happen because it's going to try. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, deceptive philosophy. See, the world is full of hollow philosophies, ideas that sound wise on the surface. It might even look like it's compassionate and, and agreeable on the surface. But upon further inspection, it's empty of God's truth. It's, it's hollow he says, which depends on human traditions. What, what truth? They call it right, and they've been calling it right and good, and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, meaning there's demonic principles behind the deception, rather than on Christ. So as with all of the topics that we're going to be addressing, this one's not easy. It's a topic that's caused a lot of division, a lot of debates. People try to politicize it. It's not a political conversation. This is a biblical, theological conversation I'm going to have with you today. And God's truth is not meant to divide us. It's meant to heal us, church. Amen. I'm not here trying to, like, bring division or hate. I want to bring healing and life. So our message today is titled, Abortion, the Truth Behind the Choice. The Truth Behind the Choice. So there's, there's four types of people in the room today or watching online. I'm so glad you're here. Hang with us, you guys, or even outdoor in our courtyard Four types of people watching today or as this lives forever. The first, the first category of person, the group, the first group is the people who say, well, abortion's wrong. It's wrong. And I would venture to say statistically, like most of the people in the room would probably say that. But even today, I hope that you are, and I will challenge you. Be ready to be challenged through the word of God today, even if that is your, your belief. Second group of people are those who say abortion is okay. Whether some of you say with no restrictions, with some restrictions, with, with certain situations, in some form or fashion, there is a group of people here today that might say abortion, I believe, is okay. And I just want you to know, I'm going to confront your belief today with the word of God. And just to be ready with that, okay? The third group of people are those who are maybe considering having abortion themselves. Or maybe even just considering that that might be an option in the future. And, and I would ask you to just be open to the Holy Spirit for God to reveal truth 
to you and for you to be even open to an objective truth that God actually has a truth, a will, and a righteous standard that is not for him. It's actually for you, to bless you. And, and when you actually fall into, you submit to and surrender to God's righteousness, to God's truth, to God's standard, it doesn't equal a lesser life for you. It is a life that is blessed and free. And I want you to maybe consider for the next 30 minutes or so that we have together to just ask God to reveal his truth and his will to you if you're in that category. And then there's a fourth category, though, of people that may have experienced and had an abortion in the past. And maybe today, if you feel like Maybe you're doubling down on that decision to help yourself feel right. So you're like, you're an advocate now about it and, and, and women's rights or something because, because it helps you with, with, your, with your decision. Or, or maybe you went the other direction and you feel so much shame and so much guilt from, from your past. And I just want you to know, please, I'm not, I'm not communicating today and nothing else. I don't want to shame you or guilt you at all. I want you to know you're not alone. You are not alone. In, in having a past and making decisions that actually have brought pain or shame or guilt. Every single one of us here, myself included, can I tell you, like you're not alone even in that decision. When I was young in high school, before I ever met Veronica, I was irreligious, drug addicted, drug using, drug selling. I told you my life, I was not always a Christian, you guys. I actually experienced a couple, two abortions as a teenager, okay? The first time, it was like, it's your choice, I'll support you. Second time, because it hurt so bad. I wasn't even a believer, but knew that something was wrong about this. This, didn't, this, this felt off and, and, and tried to maybe advocate the second time to, to do something different, but failed in that advocation. I just, I want you to know, I'm not sharing my opinion. I, I actually, had, that caused me to go on a journey of, of seeking God's truth in scripture. So I'm not sharing with you my, my past and my experience or my thoughts. I want to share with you the word of God. Because it's, it's where I have found healing and comfort is from the word. We're going to study the truth of God's word today. And I'm asking every one of you to just come on this journey with me and leave your opinions again. And leave what other people say. Just come with an open heart and receive what God has to say. I promise you, I will speak the truth in love today. It doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, but I will speak the truth in love today. My prayer is that as we walk this out today, you'll have more clarity and less confusion, that you'll, you'll, you'll leave here with more compassion and not condemnation, okay? Let me, let me give you some stats, though, because oftentimes when we talk about abortion, there's, there's the, the conversation or the arguments get, get brought up about like, well, what about rape? What about incest? What about these abusive situations? And the challenge with that, you guys, is always you got to be careful in debates like this. And, and this is not a debate, by the way, but when people try to debate you, what they'll, what they'll do is because they can't make the central case, they make the extreme argument. Okay? They can't make the central, so they go to an extreme and say, well, what about, what about this? So, so let me just give you some stats on that. I hope you kind of see this in the right light. From the National Right to Life Committee, this is just where abortions are coming from, decisions. Why are, why are people having abortions? 0.4% of abortions are actually due to rape and incest. Such a small like, percentage that, that people want to make the argument about, that is not the, uh, even the argument. Now, there is a case to be made. I'm not even going to go there, though. It's 0.4%, you guys. 0.3% of abortions are due to health risks of the mother, which, by the way, have always been legal. Those aren't even abortions. They call them abortions, but that's just life saving care, okay? And that's always been legal to save the life of, of a mother. So that's not even like that, not even considered an abortion, you guys. It's that, like, yes, the pregnancy gets terminated, but that's not considered an abortion. 1.2% of abortions are actually due to fetal abnormalities where there's life-threatening conditions of the baby. And then 2.2% um, of abortions are due to other physical health abnormalities. That means where it's not life-threatening, but there was something abnormal about the baby 2.2% of the time. 95% of abortions, though, are for elective or unspecified reasons. Reasons such as, I'm not ready. This will affect my career. I'm not mature enough. I don't love him, okay? This 95%, and since, since the passing of Roe v. Wade in 1973, since it was legal, there's been recorded now, just recorded abortions, 63 million 
abortions in the United States alone. And when I say recorded, emphasize that because there are many states like the state we live in, in California, that do not report in the, the accurate data because they don't want the data out there. There's 63, to give you context again, because that that, that's a big number, you guys. The total amount of U.S. soldiers that have died in war is 1.3 million at all of U.S. history. In the Holocaust, the atrocity of the Holocaust, there were 6 million Jews who were exterminated, killed. Six, 10 times the amount. So t- today, here's, here I wa- here's how I want to frame the conversation. And, and again, if, you're, if, if you like it and you agree with it, you need to say amen, okay? Come on, help me out up here. This is a hard conversation. Today, I want to answer, though, four questions. I want to pose and answer four questions in light of God's word that often arise when we discuss abortions. And then I'm going to give you some new choices to make then in light of God's truth because there definitely is a choice that we need to make, but it needs to be a choice that's lined up with truth. Amen, somebody? Now, these are questions that you may have heard. They're perhaps even questions that you've even wrestled with yourself. They're tough and they deserve real answers, not like shallow responses, not cliches, but deep, biblically grounded truth. So let me give you the four. Here's the first one. Number one, isn't this whole conversation here forcing my morality on others? I feel bad. Like you shouldn't even be talking about this, Pastor. Like this seems like, like it's just forcing morality on others, which is like at the heart of what many people believe is the core issue. This perceived imposition of morality. We need to understand something about this question though. Isn't this forcing my morality on others, what we need to understand, you guys, is every legal system reflects some set of values and morals. Whether it's protecting life, it's ensuring justice, it's defending the vulnerable, write this down. All laws legislate morality. The real question is, whose morality are we legislating? That's the real question. Every time you vote, every law on the books is a reflection of a standard or a moral. The reality is, it's just whose morals then is going to be the standard of the land. It's going to be the majority. That's what it's going to be. Try applying this logic, though, of, of you know, you're forcing your moralities in, the other, in other contexts, Right? Don't force your moralities. Like, try, 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 try using that logic on slavery. Okay, I don't believe in it, but who am I to say that someone else can't, you know, own the slave? Who am I to say what someone else can't do on their own plantation? We would have never abolished slavery if people did not have a moral standard and try to advance a moral standard for society. We will not have the women's suffrage movement. Well, it's not, I mean, I think women, they should be able to vote and have jobs and stuff like that. And, and, but who am I to say if, if, you know, someone wants to oppress their women in their, you know, in their home or their job or their state? Who am I to say anything against that? Just try applying this logic. What about child abuse? I'm not for child molestation or incest, but who am I to say that a parent, what the parent does with their own children in their own house, that's not in my business. Just apply, apply the logic. How about the Holocaust? No, I'm not for exterminating Jews or anything, but who am I to say what another nation does with their own citizens? I mean, it just doesn't work. Here's the uncomfortable truth. If we don't legislate God's morality, we're implicitly choosing to legislate another set of values. Values that often conflict with the heart of God, with God's justice, and with God's life. Now, to be clear, we're not talking about forcing, we're not talking about forcing people to worship. We're just saying, oh, aren't you? That's, we're not talking about forcing people to worship, forcing people to attend church, forcing people to get baptized or to take communion. It's not about religious beliefs. We're just talking about what is good, what is moral, morals. That is the law, the law all laws are a reflection of that. Proverbs chapter 24 says it like this, rescue those who are led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. But if you say, oh, but but we knew nothing about this. It's not my place. Look what he says. Does not the one who weighs the heart perceive what you're doing? Does not the one who guards your life know that you're trying to sidestep for your own face? He will not repay everyone, or he, he will not repay everyone according 
Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? It's not my place to say. You know, neutrality in the face of injustice is not moral. It's actually silent agreement with evil. This passage in Proverbs 24 is a direct call to action. It's God's call to us to intervene when we see harm and destruction, especially harm that is hidden or justified under deceptive philosophies. See, abortion isn't just a moral issue. It's a justice issue. It's about defending those who cannot literally defend and speak for themselves. It's, it's about defending the most vulnerable among us babies in the womb. We're, 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 we aren't forcing morality on others. We're choosing to stand for a morality that reflects God's justice and reflects God's mercy, the morality of the value of every life, born and unborn. To stay silent in the face of this injustice, it's not love. It's indifference. And this topic needs the truth of God's word to be shined on it, you guys. We need to shine the word of God on this topic. Okay, but here's... I think the biggest question, number two, is really, well, when does life begin? Right? This is the real question that should shape the conversation. Is that a person in the womb? And and when, then, does that become a person? This question is at the heart of the abortion debate and conversation. When does life begin? truly begin is it at birth is it is it there's actually four different thoughts on this four major thoughts on when life begins the first thought is conception these aren't in your notes let me just give you the four major thoughts some say when the sperm meets the egg actually when the sperm meets the egg a new dna is formed at that moment immediately when that sperm meets the egg dna that was never has been dna and never ever will be replicated dna a dna is created at that moment Conception. The second thought is viability. It's, it's, it's when that baby can survive outside the womb, it is viable. If they can live for themselves, and that's when it's an actual person. The third school of thought here is desire. It's, it's created by desire. It's a person huh, when the woman wants it to be a person. Riddle me this, y'all. Okay, if... If someone can murder a pregnant woman and get charged for double homicide, but a woman can decide she doesn't want it and it's no longer murder, it's relabeled as health care. Come on. It's this, I'm just, I'm trying to give you some both logic and word. I'm going to give you some science in this too, okay? It's just, it's conception, it's viability. Here's another thought. How about desire? The other one is birth. Like the person is created. Personhood is, is when they're, born okay okay here that's the thoughts but what does god say that's what that's what we're here to understand what does god say i'm going to show you both science and scripture to answer this fundamental question because science does confirm the word of god y'all know that it's funny how some people like they're all follow the science follow the data until the science conflicts with what they believe you know what i mean it's biology, okay? Week number one, right? You're a male or female. They don't like that. So, no, no, that's, they don't want to follow the science now. Don't follow the science now. Don't even follow the science or the data on sexual immorality because the data, the data will show you that we are jacking this thing up. And every time that you do it outside of God's will and live sexually immoral, it's not going to work. It's just not, okay? So follow the science and data as long as the science and data agrees with me. And then when it doesn't, science and data is wrong. It's just ridiculous. But let me help you all out here, okay? Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Let me give you the word of God. The word of God. When, when Mary, who's, who has been conceived with the child Jesus of the Holy Spirit, goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, the Bible says when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, she had John the Baptist, remember, in her womb. That baby, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. At the moment that this, you want to call it an embryo or a fetus, that baby inside of Mary comes to Elizabeth, John the Baptist took notice. Can I tell you something? That was still the son of God living in Mary's womb. Jesus did not become the savior of the world, Emmanuel, the bread of life. At some point, he was already and always was, even in the womb. He was. And if you want to get, like, even in the Greek here, like what's used, the actual language, the baby leap, John the Baptist, the word is brephos, 
That word baby is the same word used every time. It's actually used of Jesus when he was born in the manger, when the angels make the announcement to the shepherds in the field, a baby is born to you this day. Like, like it's the same word that's used. It's not a different word. It's not a different type. It's not a different category. It is a human. It's human. J Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, before God says, before I formed you in the womb, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. See, God is not just acknowledging life here, but he's knowingly and intimately shaping it with intention. But we don't just lean on scripture alone here. But there's, science too gives us some profound evidence that life begins far earlier than people would like to admit. Consider this, at 18 days after conception, the baby's heart begins to beat. Before a woman oftentimes even knows she's pregnant, that beating heart is inside of her. And at six weeks, the heartbeat is strong enough to actually be detected in an ultrasound. Or how about this? At the end of the first trimester, the baby has fingerprints, has functioning organs, and is able to react and to touch. By 12 weeks, the child can open and close its fingers, curl its toes, and respond to external stimuli. They actually, because of like the, the science now available to us, they, they have seen like what happens and have recorded what happens when the egg and the sperm meet for the first time. Like this is, this is one of the photos under microscope. This is the sperm, this is the egg. When the sperm meets for the very first time, you see a burst of light actually radiate from the egg. It's, it's, it is, it is wherever, where there's light, there's life. They study this and they say, well, well, this looks like to be like a zinc release off the egg. But the beautiful thing is physiologically, spiritually, God actually created your body, women of God. And he created your body to have a burst of light the moment that you conceive with a, with a child. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? It's, 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 it's so beautiful beautiful, so intricate, so, so intentionally designed, and God is not silent about when life begins. He declared it long ago, and even science bears witness of this truth. Life's not an accident. The Bible declares life begins at conception. Let me, let me say it like this. God is the author of life. All life. God authors. There is no life without God creating life. Psalm 139, David says it like this, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, God, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, like what we just saw. I mean, it was, it was in secret, intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book, were, they were written, every one of them, the days that we were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. See, David's words here, they're not just poetry. This is profound theology. They want to make this a political conversation. This is not political. This is theological. This is spiritual. God is not distant or uninvolved. He is the author of life, shaping and forming every child in the womb, knowing their days before they've even taken a single breath. You know, in, in, in studying this, I actually saw some different interviews of scientists and, and people and just kind of read a lot, as I always do for uh, these sermons. But I watched this chilling interview of a Planned Parenthood abortion doctor who actually said he has nightmares about the afterlife that to see the thousands of faces of the people that he has killed, of the, of the human. See, see, outside the womb, it's called murder, but inside it's called a choice. But what's the difference in light of God's word? Murder is defined by intent, not geography. Okay, so, so we answered, you know, okay, what, isn't this forcing my morality on others? When does life begin? Here, here's the third question that you probably heard. Shouldn't a woman have control over her own body? Like, like who are you? Some pastor, let, a man, get out of my cervix, man. Who are you? Okay, but, but again, before we decide what's right, we got to decide who's right. And this is why, this is why I taught uh, week one and week two, transgenderism and homosexuality, because God created them male and female. 
And he created you with intention and purpose. And he created you on purpose for a purpose. So for those of you that are women today, listen to me. God created you on purpose for a purpose. Part of your design as a woman is the beautiful responsibility of carrying life. That's how God created you and designed you. And if we know that and agree with that, then you would, you would treat this much differently. Uh, this Catholic philosopher, Peter Kreeft, he said... Abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist, of, of communion. That's why it uses the same holy words, this is my body. The same word with the opposite blasphemous meaning. Do you think it's a coincidence that the central phase of the pro-abortion movement is the same phrase that Jesus used in the, in the Last Supper, the phrase of, of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this is my body. And because Planned Parenthood is not only the largest abortion provider, they're also the largest provider of transgender drugs. They call both of these mutilations of children healthcare. See, transition surgery is called gender affirming care. And abortion is called reproductive health care. But referring to abortion as health care is like calling slavery human rights. It's a deception. It is, it is dishonest. It is wrong. So if they can't kill them inside the womb, they'll mutilate and kill them outside the womb. And they practice this by using bodily autonomy arguments. This is my body. The same words Jesus said. And if I want to kill what's inside my body, then it's my choice. Because of that, abortion is the sacrament of Satan. Because it says you must die so I can live. But Jesus said, I must die so you can live. And he chose, above all places, Jesus chose to enter humanity in a uterus. Of all locations, the savior of the world came in a uterus to save mankind of all their sins. Let me say it like this, church. The location of the heartbeat doesn't determine its worth. See, the pro-abortion argument often hinges on the idea that a woman's body is under her own control, even if it means terminating the life inside her. But the issue isn't about control over a body. It's about recognizing the value of life no matter the location. Okay, let me get one last question before we make some new choices today together. Write this down, number four. How do we get here, though? And why even should we care today? I hope that you understand this question after the talk. How do we get here? And why should we care? So to understand abortion, uh, why abortion is such a prominent issue today, I think we need to take a look back, and not even just a few decades, not to Roe v. Wade, but all the way to the Old Testament, where similar practice took place. The ancient Israelites encountered a culture around them that sacrificed their children to the pagan god Molech. It was a trade. They, they traded lives for a quality of life, okay? It was a trade. The life of a child for the promise of prosperity, success, and personal gain. And while the name has changed, the underlying principle has not. We're trading lives today for a promise of a quality of life. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, there is a way that appears right to you, but in the end is death. See, our culture, like ancient cultures, they often follow the path that seems right. It promises freedom, autonomy, and choice. But God's word warns us that this way, if it contradicts his truth, ultimately leads to death and destruction. Abortion is portrayed as a right, but it's a right that ends in a loss of an innocent life. See, what culture calls progress, God often calls perversion. Let me show it to you in Leviticus chapter 20 where the Israelites were introduced to this culture around them that was accepting of this trading of lives of children. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from this people. For by sacrificing his children to Moloch, he has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. See, this worship of Moloch involved parents placing their children into the arms of a burning idol. 
sacrificing them for the promise of security, of prosperity, of relief, maybe even, you know, relief of hardship. But God's command was so clear to them, do not sacrifice your children. He called it an abomination. See, today's sacrifices, they're not on ancient altars. They're in clinics and operating rooms. The rationale may be different, but it's the same thing. We're trading lives for a quality of life. Financial stability, career prospects, convenience. But the trade-off remains the same, a trading of lives for a quality of life. We are sacrificing the vulnerable for perceived or promised benefits for our life or future. And just like in the days of Moloch, it defiles what God calls sacred. See, abortion is our culture's modern idolatry. It is the exaltation and worship of a false god named Moloch, a trade of the innocent for the illusion of freedom. Now, again, every week, I'm gonna give you more resources because I can't fit them into just one message. So I got a QR code here, and I think it's even on your notes today. If you wanna scan this, take a look at those, maybe read and research and discover truth, For yourself on this, please feel free to. We even have today outside in a canopy, we have the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center with us. This is is one of the nonprofit ministries that we support as a church that is helping parents uh, with resources, with planned and unplanned pregnancies. God's truth doesn't change to fit our trends. We change to fit God's truth. So in light of his truth, Let me give you some new choices today, how to choose God's way. I want to be clear, this is not about condemnation. This is about a new beginning for us, church. God's way isn't always easy, but it's always good. He calls us to make choices that honor him, even when it's counterculture. And today, I want to challenge you with four choices. Choices I believe will lead you to freedom, will lead you to purpose, will lead you to truth. Okay, number one, in light of God's truth, commit to honor God with your body. Commit to honor God with your body. We would not be here where we are today at 63 million recorded abortions if we were honoring God's, God's model of marriage, of, of, of sexual morality. It would not be, it, if we were not following the world's way of sexual immorality, it just wouldn't happen. So the first commitment is to honor God with your body. Our culture tells us, use your bodies however you want. But freedom isn't found in doing what we want. It's found in doing what we are made for. God has given each of us a body, not as a tool for our desires, but as a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20 in the Living Bible says, Haven't you yet learned that your body is the home of the Holy Spirit God gave you? And He lives in you. Your body does not belong to you, for God has bought you with a great price. So use every part of your body to give glory back to God because he owns it. What you do with your body is a declaration of what you believe about God. Maybe you've made choices with your body body that you regret. Maybe you've treated what is sacred as something common, but there's hope. God's grace is big enough to redeem every mistake and restore what you've lost. Your body has been bought with a price, and that price was the precious, precious blood of Jesus. It's, it's not about perfection. It's about surrender. The first choice in light of God's truth is to commit to honoring God with our bodies. The second choice is this. Choose to stand for others. Choose to stand for others. In a world that often prioritizes self-interest, God calls us to do the opposite, to stand for the vulnerable, to stand for the innocent, to stand for the voiceless. Proverbs 31 and 8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Well, it's not my place. It is your place, child of God. This is your place. God has called us to be a light in the midst of darkness. And Jesus says, if they persecute you, be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. Speaking up for those who can't defend themselves is not an option. It's a command of God. This includes the on board, but honestly, it includes anyone who's been marginalized and overlooked. How can we do that? How can we speak up? How can we stand for the voiceless? How can we stand? You can do it in a few, in a few days with your vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Some of y'all want me to. I'm going to tell you who to vote for. That's ridiculous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the word of God to bring context into your voting. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to teach you the word of God to give you context of how can you be a kingdom citizen in this, in this world and in this day. And, ho- and, and then you can, by, by deduction, make hopefully a good, a good decision based on God's word. I'm not telling you who to vote for, man. Because, hey, Jesus isn't on the ballot last time I checked, you know. <laughs> but that doesn't recuse you of making the best choice possible for your children or for your nation. Okay? We're not voting for a savior. You're voting for a president. I'm going to talk more about this next week, okay? Right before the election. Right before the election. Right when it's hot. (laughs) Scolding hot. Okay. Choose to stand for others. This is a choice that we must make in light of God's truth. I I need to choose to honor God with my body. I I need to choose to stand for others. Number three. I got to stop trading lives for quality of life. I need to trade my life for the life of Jesus. Amen. That's the trade. That, they see, the enemy is lying to you that you could actually trade the life of your unborn child for a better quality of life. There's actually a different trade that he doesn't want you to make. He don't want you to make the real trade. God's call is not just to a change of behavior. It's to a surrender our very lives to him. He invites us to trade our old life of sin and self-focus for a new life of purpose and peace with him. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the true exchange, our brokenness for his wholeness, our guilt for his shame. There is an exchange to be made. There's a trade to be made for a quality of life, but it's not the trade of an unborn child. It's your life for his. That's the trade. That's the choice. When we look at God's word, this is the choice that we must make. This is where it leads us to, to die to yourself to die, to honor God with your body, to choose to stand for those who cannot literally stand for themselves, to trade my life for Jesus. And then number four, to receive God's grace. This is a choice, a choice. For some of you is really hard because the guilt you're under, but this, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, listen to me, God's grace is enough for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Will you receive this word of God? There is therefore now no condemnation. The truth of God's word is not intended to be used for condemnation. Okay? Now, listen. The truth condemns you if you reject the truth. It will condemn you. Okay? But when you accept the truth, it doesn't condemn you. It convicts you and brings freedom. So so there is therefore now no condemnation, but it doesn't stop there. It's not a period there. You can't just live like how you want to live and be like, oh, there ain't no condemnation. No, no, no. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what he has to offer you. Because every one of us stand condemned apart from Jesus. We do. Our guilt, our sin, our past. The only reason why I can stand up here and share God's word confidently, even though I have a past that is stained and immoral and scandalous, is because that Jason died a long time ago. He's dead. See, grace is God's way of rewriting our stories with his love. There is no sin too great, no mistake too permanent that his love can't cover. If you've made choices that have led to pain, whether it be abortion or anything else, to be honest, God's grace doesn't just offer you forgiveness. It offers you a fresh start because Jesus doesn't just forgive. He transforms. He changes. He makes all things new. He takes our brokenness and he makes something beautiful. Today, the invitation is simple. In light of the truth of God's word, receive his grace because it's already yours. Don't live under the weight of shame when Christ offers the freedom of forgiveness. There is no condemnation in Christ, only hope, healing, and a future. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event. 
and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.